Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Dear Lord, fill our hearts and our lives with your word. Defend us against the evil and the evil one. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends, call to fight against evil. Whispering campaigns have been around throughout history. A whispering campaign is when one group uses rumors and lies to ruin the reputation of a person or another group in order to keep people from following them. In the 1800 election, John Adams was running against Thomas Jefferson. Adams' followers started a whisper campaign. By rumor, they falsely accused Jefferson of having robbed a widow and her children of their trust fund and of having fathered numerous mulatto children by various slave women. They believed that this would then encourage the citizens to discourage citizens to vote against Jefferson and encourage them to vote for Adams. Jefferson won the election. Keep that in mind as we use the statement, Jesus delivers from evil. And we consider the words of Luke 11, 14 to 28. These words begin. Jesus, the one who came to save us, our king, was driving out. He's defeating a demon, an evil angel, that was mute. This demon made it impossible for the man to speak. Matthew tells us that the man also was blind. It made it impossible for him to see. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and he could see. And the crowd was amazed. No one at that time doubted the power of the devil and his underlings. And so to see Jesus just drive this demon out, it astonished him. Some of the crowd were so happy they probably cheered for Jesus. They were happy Jesus had defeated this evil. Some in the crowd identified by Matthew as Pharisees and then Mark by scribes, didn't cheer. But they began a whispering campaign. Thinking that Jesus couldn't hear them, they murmured to those near them, by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, by the power of the devil, he is driving out demons. They basically accused Jesus of working for the devil. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. They, they whispered, you know, if Jesus is the Messiah, then he should do more than just drive out demons. He should give you a special sign from God. Well, Jesus gave them that sign. Even though Jesus didn't hear them, Jesus knew their thoughts and showed them that he knew their thoughts when he said, any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? If Satan goes about casting out his evil underlings, he's just destroying his own kingdom. He's not going to do that. His kingdom's going to fall. And Jesus says, I say this because I know your thoughts. I know what you say, even though you say it in whispers. I know you claim that I drive out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive out demons? So then they will be your judges. Jesus says, okay, if I'm doing it by Beelzebub, then your followers must be doing it by Beelzebub also. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. The term finger of God comes from the book of Exodus. After the third play of gnats, Pharaoh's magicians came to him and said, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh wouldn't listen. His heart was hardened. And just as the Lord had said, it would be. Then another time in Exodus, after the Lord had finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him two tablets of the testimony, the tablets of stone inscribed by the finger of God. Now the Gospel of Matthew, when it recounts this event, calls the finger of God the Spirit of God. 
And with these words, Jesus is telling those who had begun this whispering campaign, those who opposed him, they were opposing the Lord God. They were like the Pharaoh who fought against the Lord. Well, number one, Pharaoh thought he was a god and thought he could defeat the Lord. And number two, he didn't want to lose the power and wealth that came to him by enslaving the Hebrews. And these who opposed Jesus did so also because they foolishly believed they could defeat Jesus, the Son of God. Come into the flesh, the finger of God, and did not want to lose their wealth and power that came from being religious leaders in Israel. Jesus continues. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. Jesus uses an earthly truth that those with more power defeat those with less power. You think back to the wars in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. The United States Army was more powerful than their armies and they drove out the strongmen Saddam Hussein and the Taliban. More current events. The Russian army is more powerful than the Ukrainian army. So they go into the Crimea and they take it. It's the way the world works. And then Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. He says, you're either on Jesus' side, God's side, or you're on the devil's side. There's no middle ground. There's no fence to sit on thinking, you know, I'm superior to both. I, I will not commit to serving Jesus, and I will not serve the devil. I'll just wait and see what happens, and then take what I want for myself. And Jesus makes this point because those who opposed him believed that they were better than the devil, and they were better than Jesus. And they, uh, and not, they, 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 they opposed the devil but they would not repent. They would not come and commit themselves to following Jesus, the Savior sent by God, even though Jesus did the works sent by God. In addition, some of those had not committed to trusting in Jesus that were in the crowd. They cheered when Jesus cast out the demon or performed a miracle, yet they didn't trust in Jesus. They did not want to anger the Pharisees, didn't really want to upset Jesus. They wanted to sit on the sidelines and decide how it was, the battle was going to end and pick a side and be on the winning side. And Jesus went on to explain why there is no middle ground. He says, when an evil spirit, uh, better translated as an unclean spirit, an impure, vicious, idol, worshiping spirit, comes out of a for a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest. It goes looking for a new home and doesn't find it. And then it says, I will return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Without the demons present, the life, man's life becomes more regular. You take the mute man, he could not speak, uh, hear, then you could see. It becomes organized. Jesus said the spirit left. But he talks about an empty house. Or a person not filled with God's word. Well, then the spirit goes and sees it's empty, takes seven other spirits who are wicked than itself, and they go and they live there. And the final condition is of the man is worse than the first. You know, just getting rid of something evil does not defeat evil. It's not enough to throw out a demon or evil spirit. God has to take its place in your life. Otherwise, the evil angel will return with other evil angels to rule that person's life again. And he'll be in a worse shape. Earthly example. People of a nation decide to clean house. They have an evil dictator ruling them. We've seen this in the Middle East. They put a great deal of effort getting rid of that evil dictator and his crony. They're very happy to get rid of him. They cheer. However, they don't commit themselves to changing their nation from a nation that's ruled by men to a nation that's ruled by laws. So, and they say, well, it's over, this guy's gone, now let's live for ourselves. And, and soon then, 
another strong man comes. And he takes over their nation and his throne. In the spiritual war for souls, between Jesus and Satan, the same thing happens. Jesus frees a sinner from the power of Satan. Sends that Satan away. Jesus cleans house, so to speak. And the sinner's happy. And he cheers for Jesus. And Jesus says, now, you're clean, now do this. He says, if anyone will come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow. And then he tells him, I am the true vine, and you are, and my father is the garden. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that bears fruit he prunes, so it will even be more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. In other words, you need the word of God in you. Jesus is the word made flesh. However, that cleansed sinner says, I don't need to listen to Jesus. I want to go live for myself. So he stops listening to God's word. Oh, he might say many things like about Jesus, good things like that woman in the crowd who said, Well, the blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. Now you would think, expect Jesus would say, Yeah, my mother was great. But no, Jesus kind of gives an unexpected, rather sharp answer. He says, Because after all, you know, when Elizabeth came to, 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 to Mary, she said, Blessed are you among women. But Jesus doesn't give us, does that. He, he goes and he gives this answer instead that's kind of sharp. Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And another point in time, Jesus made the point. Some people came to him and his mothers and brothers came to see him, but they weren't able to get them because of this problem. And so someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside waiting, just wanting to see you. And he replied, my brother, mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it in practice. Jesus wants those who follow him to do more than say good things about him. He wants them, first of all, to believe the word of God that tells them he is the son of God and that his miracles show that he is, uh, the, his, the, that the finger of God was working. To believe that Jesus won the war against evil that when he suffered and he died on the cross and he said it is finished and then rose from the dead, he defeated Satan and, and freed all who believe him from the devil's power and that he has the power to keep them from evil. And then he wants them to fill their lives with the word of God and to strive to obey it by displaying their faith, by doing more than cheering Jesus on, by doing battle against the devil in both words and deeds. And therefore, dear friend, listen to and obey the word of God you heard earlier that declares. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's people, holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place. But rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore don't be partners with them. For you were once in darkness, but now you are the light of the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So fill your life with God's word and then live it. Fill your life with God's word and hear about David, who not only saying, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God is my rock and whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He's my stronghold, my savior, and my refuge. From violent men you saved me. Who said, I prayed to the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and I was saved from my enemies. 
The waves of death swirled around me, the torrents of destruction overwhelmed me, the cords of the grave coiled around me, the snares of death confronted me, and in my distress I called to the Lord. I called out to my God, and from his temple he heard my voice. His cry, my cry came to his ear. David's talking about his life. David lived a life by faith. And, his, and when he was chosen to be king, what was the first thing that happened in his life? He took his life in his hand, and he went out and fought that evil giant Goliath and defeated him. He, put, he didn't just say, well, I believe in you, Lord. He went out, and he lived his life. And you could go through the rest of David's life and find how God delivered him again and again and again. David filled his life with the word of the Lord. Fill your life with the word of the Lord, like the Apostle Paul, who tells us at one time he was deserted by everyone. Yet the Lord stood at his side, that through him the message of Jesus crucified and risen might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. Paul lived his life. If you study Acts, and you study his epistles, you will find Paul was often in danger, and he put his life in his line for God. And the Lord delivered him. There was one time, he puts it in Timothy, he was, the Lord delivered him from the lion's mouth. Fill your life with God's word. And here are the many others who stood up and said, I'm on the Lord's side. And displayed their faith by their deeds. You know, at home this week, take some time, take out your Bible, look at Hebrews chapter 11. And read it through. And you get a list of people who displayed their faith by their deeds. If you just read through the Bible, you see people time and again putting their lives in the Bible. Don't have a lot of time for Maybe some of you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the fiery furnace. Put their life on the line. Daniel, lion's dead, put their life on the line. Regularly, read your Bible. And, many, and here are the many times the Lord delivered those who trust Him. Commit your life into the Lord's almighty hands. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow Him. Believe that the Lord is your rock, your fortress, your refuge, shield, stronghold, the horn of your salvation. Trust the Lord Jesus to deliver you from every evil attack and bring you safely to his heavenly kingdom. Jesus delivers from evil. Amen.